Hi everyone, I hope you're doing good and welcome to another exciting video on payments authorization. Uh, our next video in the series of cards and payments domain knowledge. And before I move ahead, a very, very important request. If you have come to this channel, if, if you found the content useful, please consider subscribing. Uh, I see a lot of people watching the video and they do not subscribe. Uh, every single subscriber added really helps me and really motivates me. So please, please, please subscribe to the channel. Please give it a like, share it with your friends if you think that it's worth sharing. Thank you. So with that, let's get started. Uh, and in this video, we are going to deal specifically about payments authorization. As you all know, there are three different processes, authorization, clearing, clearing and settlement. However, we will be looking specifically into payments authorization in this video. Yeah. So whether it's a, a POS swipe that you do when you um, buy something from a merchant or you do a shopping online and whether it's a debit or credit, uh, the, the process by and large is sort of same. OK, so what happens in the background is uh, when you do a request for payment authorization, as in when you are swiping your card in a shop, there are there are multiple things that happen in the background and all of this happens you know, in, 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 in a fraction of a second, really, yeah? Maybe uh, maybe one or two seconds or even less than that. Uh, and what happens there is that your balance is checked, it's checked whether you're, there's any problem with your account, you know, whether your account is blacklisted. Um, there are all sorts of authentication that's being done. And then once everything is verified and it's found that um, this transaction is good, you get the approval. And then from the POS machine, you get the receipt generated, which you carry back home along with the goods. Okay, so uh, this happens, uh, this is the regular process that happens everywhere. Now, what we will do is we will look into a definition of payments authorization and I've taken this uh, definition from the MasterCard website. Okay, and uh, as you can see, there are four different steps um, that I have tried to indicate here. The first is you go to the shop or the merchant, whether it's an online merchant um, or whether it's a, a brick and mortar store and you swipe the card. As, an, as a step two, yeah? And once the card swipe happens or whether, you know, whether when you initiate a transaction, there is a set of instructions that follow in the background. Uh, and there is a there is a combination of hardware and software um, uh, that is being governed by the card scheme or the network as well. And that takes care of, of this process and it ensures that you get an approval at the end of it. Yeah, whether an approval or a rejection is something, it depends on the verification, of course. But then if everything is found successful, you get an approval. Okay, so let's read the definition here. It says the process of transporting authorization requests, responses, cancellations, and advisement messages necessary to verify the identity of the cardholder, authenticity of the card, and available of availability of funds at the time of purchase. I've, I've specifically highlighted the, the three keywords over there, processes, messages and verification yeah so that's the important thing that we need to take care of and when we do this this uh, this uh, communication bit um, it's not just a request that is initiated you you do you initiate a request but then you expect a response there could be a cancellation uh, there could be some other uh, update that comes in from the um, uh, from various entities like for example acquirer could initiate uh, or the issuer bank could, could initiate that so Really, it's a, it's a, it's not just about the requests uh, when you, when we say payment authorization, right? There, there, there's a lot of different kind of uh, messages that are involved here. Now, in this slide, um, it's a bit colorful, but basically, what I've tried to do here is I've tried to indicate the payments authorization cycle. Uh, if you haven't seen the first video of the cards and payment series, which is which talks about the manic model, please do that. You can pause this video now and you can come back. But there, if you go, you can read a little bit about uh, the different entities, merchant, uh, acquirer, network, issuer, card holder. So you can understand uh, what these entities are in a little bit more detail. Um, so this is the same manic model that I'm referring here. But of course, um, the card holder is, is now um, sitting on the extreme left hand side and the issuing bank is on the extreme right hand side. Now, what happens is you have a card. <clears throat> it doesn't matter whether it's a it's a debit or a credit card or whether the scheme is a visa or a mastercard or any other scheme but you initiate a transaction okay as a step one and then um, the merchant forwards that request to the acquirer um, as the next step okay and then the request is forwarded to the network scheme network or the scheme as and how you you call it 
and then it goes to the issuing bank. Now issuing bank is the final authority which says that yes, this is a legitimate card holder and he has got balance or she has got balance available uh, in her account and it's okay to go ahead and approve the, um, the transaction as his verification has been found successful. And then what happens is issuing bank will issue you a response and that response is then further uh, given to the network or the scheme who eventually passes it on to the acquirer and then the acquirer finally gives it to the merchant and merchant at the POS machine you would find the transaction receipt generated. So it's a simple process okay, as, uh, that you can see here. It's a request that gets initiated, flows all the way back to the issuing bank and then the issuing bank res generates a response um, and sends it back all the way to the card holder. So that's how we look at the payments authorization cycle. And at the end of it, if everything is, is done and settled, you take the goods home and the merchant um, gets the money in his account, right? Um, so the first step talks about only authorization and then what happens is um, there is a process called as clearing, which typically happens say two or three or four times in a day where um, uh, you know the books would be settled uh, as in the, uh, the the debits and the credits will need to be posted on your account as well as on the merchant's account and then we also have a settlement which happens um, in a you know in a t plus one t plus two kind of a cycle where basically um, uh, everything is settled uh, you know as in if there is a reversal or any cancellation all of those things are being taken care of so um, that's how the whole process really works now if the response is found to be negative, as in the approval fails, then the issuing bank will issue you a rejection, as in the transaction is found unsuccessful, and therefore the response is a negative response, and and you know you have to probably either use a different card or you have to look into why the transaction failed. Maybe you did not enter the right pin, maybe the transaction failed for some reason, and therefore, or there could be a technical glitch, you never know, but the transaction hasn't gone through successfully, and therefore, the response is negative. Typically, what happens is it depends on on the kind of response that you have got, right? So there's a type of response which will tell you why the particular failure happened as well. So we will now look at a little bit more, in a little bit more detail on the uh, messaging system that is involved uh, behind the scenes, right? So we have taken a look at the flow of how the information flows from one entity to the other, but what is this information actually, right? What really happens um, when a merchant says that, okay, I have initiated this as a request and it goes to the acquirer. Uh, and all of this process, like I said, happens within within seconds, right? So what really happens there? So um, these systems need to talk to each other and, and, and imagine there are thousands and millions of merchants uh, across the world, millions of cardholders across the world, there are various schemes. It would be chaotic if they do not follow one standard, right? How are you going to maintain uh, this process working seamlessly if there is no standard put in place? So um, we have a system called as ISO, okay, um, which uh, is being used here in the payments uh, messaging. Uh, typically, what we use in payments messaging is a system called as ISO 8583. Uh, this is widely used, and there are different versions of it that have been evolved with time. You know, so there is a 1997 version, there is a 1993, there is a 2003 version. There is a newer version coming in, which is called as ISO 20022. Um, this is sort of a very new standard. Um, it's not yet fully adopted. Uh, UK has recently announced that they are going to use ISO 20022 effectively, you know, from 2022. Um, and uh, there are there are various benefits. In fact, uh, you know, this topic, this whole topic of um, uh, why the need of ISO 20022 and how is this different from the older version 8583 is something that really needs a separate video and a discussion. So I plan to do that, but do leave a comment in the um, in the comment section and let me know if you would be if you would be interested to see a video on ISO 20022, um, which is a really hot and upcoming topic uh, in the messaging world and payments. Okay, so this is basically a combination of hardware and software that helps to facilitate the communication. Like I mentioned, you know, there's a POS machine, there is a set of software that is installed um, and um, installed at the acquirer place, at the issuer place. And basically this is all happening through the talking, right? And 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 very recently, um, 
even there are merchants who do not use a POS machine, but rather they would have the a sort of a software that's installed on their iPad or their phones and they can accept the payments through that. And so that's another uh, emerging trend that you would find, right? So uh, POS mas machine is also a thing uh, which was there until recently, but then it still, it still is, it's being used widely. I mean, you would go to various stores and you would find the POS machine still used, but then they're, they're, they're now moving from uh, this whole... Um, POS concept and the hardware concept to a software-based concept, so it's easy to easy for them as well, right? So imagine if you are uh, going to a restaurant uh, and you are eating food, and it's a it's a crowded restaurant, right? There are m multiple people who are eating in that. There are n number of tables, and uh, simultaneously people are approaching the bill desk for for clearing the bills, right? So so imagine. It, it takes a lot of time for, for you as a customer to wait for your turn to come and then, you know, the POS machine is free and then therefore, and, and, and what could be an example here is like, you know, every, every uh, waiter over there in the restaurant has an iPad or an iPhone with him, which has the software installed. So as soon as you're done with your food uh, and you're ready to pay, you know, you can just simply pay it over there and you don't need to, re you know, really, so this whole process has been decentralized. So that's so that's one of the advantages is what I'm trying to say, you know, when you use a software based approach. Communication begins when the card is swiped until a payment confirmation is received, right? So which which we already discussed in the previous slide. ISO 8583 has a defined structure. Every bit on that message signifies something. Uh, and we'll take a look cl closer look at this in the next slide. So we'll take a look at how this ISO 8583 message is being formed and, and what it basically does, you know, and, and, uh, and that will give us some idea uh, about about how this message flows and what are the different entities, what are the different uh, sort of mappings, uh, data mappings which are available in this message. Okay, so I hope this uh, this is uh, clear to all of you. So let's look at ISO 8583 uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, it's basically a standard that is being followed, right? And every bit of that message has some meaning associated with it, which cannot be ignored. So so let's say the first bit over there is zero, right? So basically that may indicate what's the version being used. So for example, if it's zero, uh, it, it could potentially mean that it's a 8583-1987 series message, right? So if it's one, it could potentially mean that it's 1992, or if it's two, it could potentially mean that it's 2003, um, and, and so on and so forth, right? So that's how you identify. Uh, the, the next bit is, uh, say for example, one. What basically that would mean is that uh, it will tell you whether what's the class of this message, you know, whether, so it's, if it's an authorization um, related request, then it would, me, it would be denoted by a one over there. Um, there are different other classes, right? So authorization is what we are interested in, therefore we are talking about authorization here. Next bit in the series is zero. Uh, what basically it means is what is the kind of function for this particular message. So if this is a request, if it is a response, it could have a different uh, digit over there, right? Um, what typically happens is that when ISO releases uh, this particular format, uh, they also release a guide with it, which you can go to the website and you can, you know, if you want, you can purchase that guide. If you, if you, if you are from a business establishment or let's say if you're from an acquirer firm or from an issuing bank, you can probably buy that and you can read in a little bit more detail, in fact, quite a bit of detail and understand what that guide is trying to tell you. Um, and they also leave certain certain digits as reserved, you know, for example, if they would want to evolve it with time and they would want to come up with a new sort of a, a entity that they realize is now important, let's say for fraud detection or for fraud governance, they may realize that, you know, we, let's have another bit uh, added to it. So they keep certain numbers. So maybe, you know, zero to nine is the series and then zero to five would be used across for different uh, functions like request, response, you know, um, retrieval um, and things like that. But then they may reserve certain uh, numbers like six to seven or eight might be reserved uh, for future for future use. So that's how it works. Okay. Not necessarily six to eight, six to nine. I'm just giving an example here, right? Uh, it's just a hypothetical example. Um, then the next series bit uh, over here is zero, which basically means that it is an um, who is the origin of this message? Who is the originator of this message? So this message message has been originated from an acquirer. So it's an MT0100 message. That's how we read it. MT0100 message. So MT is basically messaging type, yeah, and then um, and then 0100 is the type of message. So all of this together, all of these four things together that you see here. Uh, it are being called as message type indicator, MTI. That's how we call it as, right? So whenever we see a message, 
uh, and a message in the payment system, the first thing that you should ask is what's the MTI type? Yeah, so basically it will be a 0100, which means that it's an authorization request, um, which has been originated from an acquirer. And that's how you read it. Then the next uh, set of numbers or bits in this series is called as bitmap. And what is a bitmap? It basically specifies which data fields are present in the message. So it's more like a metadata information that you have, right? So, so the first uh, four characters will tell you the type of message. The next set of numbers, which you know, if it's um, it could be if, uh, eight bytes or sixteen, uh, uh, you know, if it's hexadecimal, uh, it depends really how you are looking at it. But this will tell you the details about the actual message, as in you know, what was the transaction amount, uh, who was the, uh, what was the merchant name or merchant ID or merchant number, whether the it's a debit or a credit kind of a transaction and all of those kind of things, right? B basically details about the transaction will be indicated through a set of different entities, which, which we call it as data entities, right? So DE, data entities is what we, we call them as. Okay, so where there could be a data entity, which is like data entity two, which would mean say, for example, PAN, which is the uh, card 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 number or, or the card number. So it could be a 16 digit or a 19 digit card number, but every single entity, like for example, if it's a PAN, it would be called as DE2. If it's a merchant number or a merchant account, it would be called as DEXY, something else and so on and so forth. So there is a series of, of data entities, okay? But how do you know that this message has which data entities, right? It would be, it would be practically impossible to, to just put everything, all those data entities into one single message. There might be data entities which are not needed in this message. Okay. So why to put them and why to make the message so heavy? Okay. So, so basically what we try to do is we try to make it a little bit more streamlined and we only put those particular entities which are actually required. And the way to identify what those entities are is by reading the bitmap. So it's more like a metadata information you can say about that particular message, okay? So this is called as bitmap, uh, very important piece of information, okay? So if you do not understand how to read a bitmap, then um, what you can do is you can actually go to uh, a link that I will put in the description. It's a Wikipedia page, uh, which talks about how to read an ISO 8583 message, and you can read a little bit more. And there are various other, um, websites which you can try to google and find out you know how to read a bitmap it's basically like you should know how the conversion works between binary to hex and things like that and if you understand that then that's that's about it and that's all you need to know so uh, then the next set of number for example over here as you can see right um, the first two numbers are highlighted in bold over here and then there is a series of digits it's basically 16 digits additionally this is the card number okay so when i read that bitmap i know that there is a de2 kind of a um, entity which is uh, present which is the card number the first two characters will tell me the length of the card number so because the length of the card number varies from uh, one issue to the other right it could be between 16 to 19 and you know depends some issuers have 16 some issuers have 19 but how do you know so the first two characters will tell you whether it's a 16 or a 19 and then the prefix would be basically the 16 digits of the card number okay the the pan uh, which we call it as the pan for the card account member so this is uh, the number of digits okay and this is our de2 data element 2 which is called as pan and then the card uh, number or the pan is indicated the next uh, in this is uh, again a set of set of numbers right and it's very difficult to understand what this is now imagine this is the importance of having a, a lookup or a map right like for example a bitmap because if you don't have that how would you know that you know what this entity means so there has to be some sort of a lookup in place or uh, that's why you know all of these entities have been uh, put forward to make the process easy for you now once decoded it is found that it's actually a timestamp it's a date when this particular message was transmitted. Okay, so this is called as DE7. The, the, the entity name the entity name is data element seven and uh, the key value basically is data element seven, but the name is transmission date and time when this message was transmitted and the actual date and time. Now, if you actually understand this a little bit more uh, thoroughly, uh, you can see that, you know, this is a 12th of February message. Uh, this was sent at about 
um, 16, 45 and 32 seconds, uh, 16 now, 1600 hours, 45 minutes and 32 uh, seconds in a UTC, uh, universal time coordinated uh, format. Okay, so this is how you have to read this. Very important for people who are into um, business analysis roles and things like that, because typically what happens is when 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 the developer is writing an application which is to deal with these kind of messages, right? There'll be a lot of questions, there'll be a lot of mismatches around the data type, um, or for example, the 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 timestamp is in what format, right? It, it is it in GMT, is it in uh, XYZ format, is it in UTC? So you have to be very very careful with these kind of things. Um, just calling it out. Okay, then what happens is uh, the next uh, series of numbers here is uh, 011 and what it basically is is uh, a method by which the PAN was entered and the capability of PAN entry device, right? So how whether it was a swipe or whether the PIN was required or not required and you know what sort of things were done at the point of entry, um, at the point of uh, swipe machine. Yeah, so that's basically DE22 um, and, and, and so on and so forth. I am not listing down all of them in, in detail but but basically this is just to give you an idea of how do you understand and read an ISO 8583 message. It's very, very simple. You just need to start from the top or the left and start decoding it. The first four is your MTI or the message type indicator, which will tell you what kind of message it is. And then subsequently it's followed with a bitmap, which will tell you different details or metadata information. Basically, this is a metadata information that tells you um, what are the different data elements that are present uh, in, in the body of the message and then subsequently the body follows which is basically you know in essential things like for example the card number the amount and the time um, when the transmission happened or when the swipe happened or whatever how, however you want to look at it and um, various other entities right so how was the card being swiped and so on and so forth so i have given a link over here which is from the iso portal okay if you are actually interested to read more about iso standards and particularly about 8583 you can go to this website and you can purchase that guide and read that now obviously if you are coming in from a business analyst background or if you're working as a developer in a cards and payments company and you have just come here to this channel and this video just to get an insight of how this works then maybe you don't need to buy this but i'm giving this link as the the uh, original source of information from where you should read about iso because if there is a change that happens then iso will make sure that the change goes down into their documentation also okay so if the if it comes down to that sort of specifics then you should always go for the original source of information otherwise there are multiple sources of information online right and you can go to various different forums and read about what iso 8583 is there is also a wikipedia page um, that you can actually browse through and read about ISO 8583, I'll, I'll leave the link for both of these two sources in the description. So please go ahead and read a little bit more. If you have questions, if you have any concerns, queries, then um, leave a comment over there and I'll pick it up as soon as I can and I'll try to help you. Okay, so that's about the messaging. And I think that's pretty much it really. So this, is, this was one example of how a message flows from the acquirer as a request right but there could be there could be different messages one could be initi initiated from an issuer as well okay um, and the issuer will send that back as a response so they would have an another MTI type okay and that would be MTI XYZZ uh, or some of the series so that's how you have to actually read and understand this it's a very interesting domain if you ask me if you have interest in, you know in doing this I have seen people doing specialization in um, in the Swift messaging and M MTI series, uh, they know all the different message types on tips, you know, because you deal with these messages day in, day out. And and so uh, to an extent where uh, it comes naturally to you, you know, in, even in your in your sleep, you can say what an MT000100 is. So um, that's it for today. I hope you liked this video. If you did, then please do give it a like and also share it with your friends who may benefit from it and please do not forget to subscribe to the video that's a humble request to all of you and do leave a comment if you have any questions uh, so with that folks i'll uh, you know end the video here and uh, i'll see you again next time with another interesting video until then goodbye